Hi there! An integrated circuit that is often used in hobbyist circuits is the venerable 555 timer. This little IC is used for many devices involving timing of all sorts and is also used as an oscillator that can go from very low frequencies to a few hundred kHz. Sometimes, however, we build a circuit on a breadboard or a perfboard and it doesn't work as we expected. And sometimes we are quick to say that the 555 must be broken. I have built the same circuit several times and it has always worked. Or maybe we say, this circuit has been described in that respectable magazine or that website. And sometimes the problem is that maybe because we built the circuit in a hurry, we made a stupid mistake connecting some wires. And don't be ashamed about that, it happened to me too. Today I will show you a little device that can help remove any doubts when a 555 circuit does not work. A device that will help you figure out if the 555 is broken or if instead the circuit was not assembled correctly. In other words, a 555 tester. Let's see how it works and how I built it. Before going any further though, please take a moment to subscribe to the channel and consider also to become my patron. Links are posted in the description below. Let's begin. Here is the functional block diagram of the 555 timer. If we want to test the correct functionality of this chip, we will need to test the several aspects of it, from the two comparators in the center, to the flip-flop on the center right, the discharge transistor on the top right, and finally the three 5K resistors that provide the voltage reference for the comparators. If we just test the 555 as an oscillator or as a mono or bistable multivibrator, we won't be able to test all the components inside at the same time, since it won't be enough to make sure that all the parts of the functional diagram are working correctly and in concert with each other. The 555 tester I designed provides instead the possibility of testing all the various pieces, but that needs to be done in steps. Let me explain how this is done by looking at the schematic. The one in the center is the 555 under test. The IC will be inserted in the circuit through a zero insertion force socket, or the so-called ZIF socket. Once the S3 switch turns the device on, if there is no IC in the socket or if the IC is totally destroyed, the two LED on the right, the green one and the red one, will both be on. In fact, the connection point of the two LEDs will not be connected anywhere and so the current will flow through resistors R1 and R2 and through the LEDs. If the flip-flop is broken in such a way that we always offer a positive voltage at its output, only the red LED will be on, because the voltage at the connection point of the two LEDs will be 9 volts and so only the red LED will be powered by a difference of potential. If the flip-flop is broken in such a way that it will always keep the output grounded, only the green LED will be on because that will be the one that is powered by a difference of potential. If we push now the S2 button, pin 4 of the 555 will be brought to 0 volts and this will cause the flip-flop to reset and it will stay in such a condition as long as we keep the button pushed. In such a case, the 555 output will go to ground and this will force the green LED on, while the red LED will stay off, because only the green LED in this case will get a difference of potential. Now, if both LED go on alternatively, but with the red one staying on for a longer time than the green one, we will know that the flip-flop is working correctly, but so will be the discharge transistor, because otherwise there will be no oscillations. We will also know that somehow the comparators are working because again there will be no oscillation otherwise and we can say the same about the three 5k resistors on the left however we will not know for sure if the comparators and the resistors are exactly within parameters unless we make a change in the timing constant made of the capacitors C1 and the resistors R4 and R5 alternatively we could just force the voltage of pin 5 to assume a value different than the one provided by the three internal resistors and that is what the push button is one is there for. Pushing the button, we will add the resistors R6 in parallel to the series of the two 5K internal resistors on the bottom side of the functional diagram, and so we will basically change the reference voltage of both comparators. I choose the value of resistor R6 in such a way that the duty cycle of the oscillator will change and will become about 50%. 
By the way, the duty cycle is the ratio between the duration of the positive and the negative parts of the square wave coming out of the flip-flop. You can indicate it with a percentage or an absolute value, which would go from 0 to 1. 0 and 1 are the limit cases where the output is constantly negative or constantly positive, respectively. So, if everything works fine on the area of the comparators and the internal resistors, whenever we push the S1 button, we should see the two LEDs go on and off alternatively at the same pace. In other words, while before pushing the buttons, the red LED stays on for longer than the green button, while the button is pushed, they stay on for about the same amount of time. And that tells us that the section of the comparators and the three internal resistors is totally sane. Let's take a look now at the prototype I made on a breadboard, to make sure that my design was sound. As we saw from the schematic, this device will have a single 9 volts power supply, so we can use a simple battery to power it up. I connected the plus and minus rails on the top of the breadboard to the ones on the bottom, so I have access to the power supply ports from both sides. These are the buttons S1 on the left and S2 on the right. I used colored caps to easily distinguish them. The green one is the one that acts on the reset and keeps the green LED constantly on. The red one is for the test of the comparators. This IC in the center is the 555 under test. Here on the left side you can see the two LEDs, the green and the red. I actually used an orange LED, but it's close enough. I basically just wanted to distinguish the negative and the positive outputs of the flip-flop, and the reddish LED represents the positive output. So, once again, the two LED will turn on alternatively. When pushing the green button, the green LED is supposed to remain on and the red LED off. Pushing the red button, the LED will start flashing faster, with a 50% duty cycle. This one is the electrolytic capacitor that is part of the timing RC network of the oscillator, along with these two resistors. This other capacitor is used to stabilize the voltage on pin type. The green button is connected to pin 4 through this resistor, and also the negative of the power supply. The red button is in series with the 3.9K resistor, which modifies the value of the reference voltage inside the integrated circuit. Let's now test it and see if it works as expected. I'm going to power the circuit through my power supply for now, which is set to 9V, which is the same voltage as the battery that will power up the device when completed. You can see now that the LEDs are alternatively blinking, which completes the first part of the test. You can also see how the red LED stays on longer than a green LED. Now I push the green button, and as expected, the LEDs stop blinking and the green one remains continuously on. This confirms that the reset the input of the internal flip-flop is working fine. If I now push the red button, which puts the 3.9K resistor in series with two of the three internal resistors that provide the reference voltages, you can see how the two LED start flashing at a higher frequency and that the duty cycle approaches 50%. This should be enough for the prototype testing, so let's now assemble the final circuit which I decided to put on a simple breadboard. Since the device will have a panel through which a number of elements will show through, I aligned all such components on the breadboard, put some marks to identify where each is located, and then took some measurements to correctly position the holes on the panel. I'll show you the design of the panel in a moment, but first let me go through the assembly of the device on the breadboard. In this particular case, I did not follow my usual sequence for assembling the components on the board, because I needed to have the mechanical components and the LED that go through the panel sit firmly in place to have a reference point for the panel design. So, the first thing I attached to the breadboard was the ZIF socket, followed by the two LEDs, with the green one on the upper right side and the red one on the bottom right. The idea is to have everything mounted on the breadboard, and then attach the breadboard itself to the back of the panel with the appropriate components to show through. More on this later. Next, I mounted the two push buttons which sit alongside the LEDs. The green button will sit close to the green LED, and the red button close to the red LED. Then I added the two resistors in series with the LEDs, and I made the connections on the back of the board. Since the smallest zip socket I was able to find has 16 pins, I decided to duplicate the 8 pins on the left with those on the right, so the 555 can sit on either side of the zip socket and still be tested correctly. And so, I made all the connections between the pins on the left side and the corresponding ones on the right side, with white wire as you can see from this picture. Then I added the two resistors, R3 and R6, that are part of the push button circuits, a few wires completed all the related connections. 
Next component was the capacitor C1, which provides the timing for the circuit. But since this is an electrolytic capacitor, I had to mount it on the connection side of the board because it's too thick and would not allow to sit the board nicely behind the panel. Then I connected the remaining resistors R4 and R5, which are also part of the timing along with the capacitor C1, and I connected all the components together. And finally I connected the battery connector and the on-off switch, which will sit directly on the panel. Once everything was done, I ran a quick test to make sure the device was assembled correctly, so I attached the battery and switched on the device. Since there was no IC on the socket, both LEDs went on as expected. Then I turned the device off and inserted a 555 in the ZIF socket, locking it in place. The IC can go either all the way to the right or all the way to the left. Turning on again the device, the LEDs started flashing, with the red LED staying on for a longer time than the green LED, again as expected. Then I went on to check the reset circuit, which is activated by pushing the upper button, the green one. Doing that, the green LED is supposed to stay on and the red LED is supposed to stay off, if the flip-flop inside the 555 works fine, of course. And in fact, that's exactly what happened in this case. Next thing I checked was the push button to test the comparators, which puts a resistor in parallel to two of the three resistors inside the IC, modifying the reference voltages for both comparators. Pushing this button, as we said already, will cause the frequency of the oscillation to increase, as well as the duty cycle to change and go to about 50%. And there we go, that's exactly what happened. One not a warning for you guys, if you build this device. Never insert or remove the IC if the tester is turned on. Always turn the tester off before inserting or remove the 555 from the ZIF socket. Given that it's so simple to insert and remove an IC from a ZIF socket, it is always tempting to do that without thinking of turning the power off first, so be careful. Now that we have verified that the circuit was built correctly and everything is fine, it is time to move on and put the circuit in its box, adjusting the panel on top of the breadboard. But let's take a look at the case design first. And here it is. It's pretty simple and as usual I built it using my 3D printer. There is a main box, which has a compartment for the 9V battery, and a front panel that will be encased into the top opening of the box. The panel has holes for the various parts that need to be accessible, the ZIF socket here on the left, the two buttons, the green and the red LEDs, and the on-off switch. So to put the whole device together, first thing to do is to install the breadboard on the back of the panel. It will fit very close to the panel itself. To keep a uniform distance and to hold everything in place, I used these double-sided sticky pads, which I cut to measure to fit all around between the panel and the board, and also one in the center. The pads on the side of the buttons had to be a little thinner than those on the ZIF socket side because there was less space available. The one in the center was even smaller. Peeling the other side of the pads once attached to the breadboard was a little difficult because of the tight space not really suitable for my fingers, but I made it, then I put the panel on top of them. And of course, because of the sticky pads, now it was more difficult to reallocate the panel because it kept sticking in the wrong position, but I made it work, finally. It is at this point that I realized that not all the pads were sticking solidly to the panel. To fix that, I had to add some glue. I did that also because acting on the zip socket and the buttons would require a certain amount of force and I didn't want the pads to detach when using the device over and over again. Glue is a much safer option in these cases. Once the glue was applied, I clipped firmly the board against the panel and I let it dry for a few hours. And here we are again after I waited for about 4 hours for the glue to dry and to cure. Last thing left to do on the panel was to attach to it the on-off switch. Now I just had to attach the battery and close the box, however, since the battery has a metal casing, I decided to put on the perf board some more pads to prevent the battery from touching the back of the board and cause a short circuit. I had to use two pads on top of each other to get the correct thickness to hold the battery in place. After closing the case, I added the finish touch by putting colored caps on the push buttons, green for the reset circuit test and red for the comparators test, so they have the same colors as 
past the LEDs. And while I was there, I also added a nice cap also to the switch lever. Now it was time for the final testing. I inserted a 555 in the socket and ran the tests. Then I did the same with the other side of the socket to make sure that they could use either side. At the last moment I also decided to make some label to put on the case and on the panel. I wasn't planning to do that initially, but you know me, I always end up putting labels on all my projects and so I did for this one. I need to tell you that I have seen both online and in some books other alternative versions for the E555 tester. However, all the devices I have seen always just merely check that the 555 is capable of working as an unstable multivibrator, which is a technical name for this kind of oscillators. However, in my experience, I have seen the 555 timers working fine as oscillators, but failing when building other kind of circuits, because the IC was partially damaged. So I used the base principle the testers I saw and added a few things to make sure I'm able to test all the functionalities of the IC. And that's how I came up with this project. Oftentimes you don't start a project from scratch, instead you take something that already exists and you enhance its capabilities to satisfy your particular needs. And that's what I did in this case. I hope you enjoyed my effort and that you will find this circuit useful as an addition to your own hobbyist slab. Before closing, I would like just to invite you to give me a thumb up and to subscribe to the channel if you are not subscribed yet. Thank you for watching this video till the end, I'll see you in the next video and as usual, happy experiments!